One of our two great political parties has made it clear that it has no interest in making America governable unless they are doing the governing. And opposition, for the sake of opposition, isn't limited to economic policy. Well, so writes Paul Krugman in his New York Times column. But that doesn't mean a president has to sit on his hands, says our next guest. Even as House Republicans and some Democrats block the extension of unemployment benefits and Republicans are holding up an arms deal that even the chairman of the Joint Chiefs says is critical, it looks bad for gridlock, but there are things the president can do. Next, The Nation magazine's editor and publisher Katrina Vanden Heuvel lays out the list, and we hear about an alternative plan for debt reduction from the progressive flank. But first, Representative Donna Edwards from Maryland's 4th offers Congress a reality check. I've stood on an unemployment line. I wasn't lazy. I wasn't not looking for a job, but I needed unemployment benefits. I stood in a food pantry, and it's humiliating, the entire experience. And so the idea that we're going to allow Americans, hardworking American families who've earned their benefits, to go home at Thanksgiving and not know whether they're going to put a turkey on the table to feed their families, we should be ashamed if we allow that to happen. We're going to put a link to Donna Edwards' website for that. And Katrina, to you for more. I mean, how refreshing to hear from Donna Edwards and what a future leader she is. She is, and I think um, she will play an important role along with the Progressive Caucus in this uh, new House. I mean, the, ha the Democrats no longer in the majority, but as you know, Blue dogs, those pesky blue dogs, lost many seats, about 30. Uh, progressives now are more coherent in the minority. And I think Donna Edwards is so wicked smart savvy about how to use the power of the minority, along with Raul Grijalva and Keith Ellison and other good members. And Do you I get the feeling that they have the spine for it now, that they're taking that message from the election? Because that's sure not the message they're getting from the media. Let's hope they're not watching, perhaps. I think they, I think they do get it. I think they see that uh, they need to stand on the side of working people, middle class. And I think they have in Nancy Pelosi someone who's been so maligned in so many different ways, but is a fighter. She certainly sounded like it this Sunday in an interview and, with uh, the New York Times Magazine. And spoke, I think, very clearly about, let's be honest, this, these next few years are going to be tough. It's hunkered down, defensive in many ways, fighting the rollback of social economic progress. But she has been very strong in stating that she thinks these deficit the deficit commission proposals, trying to balance the budget on the back of working people, unacceptable in defense of Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. And she'll have a team behind her, I think. Too. We were talking just before we went to air, and maybe it's worth sharing a little bit with the audience, sort of the atmosphere in these media discussions that you and I both take part on, in which a kind of passion, like the, the passion that Donna Edwards showed on the floor of Congress there, barely ever breaks in. It's Why so is true. that? There's something about, I think, the kind of streamlining of, a, of the establishment. You get into those seats so many of the people, and they don't have much passion or much heart. There's a little bit of head, not even enough head, <laughs> but um, it's as if they've checked their passion at the door, and I think it's so critical in these times. And people, average people, must look at the screens and see the disconnect, which you and I talk about. It's often not left versus right, but it's top down. It's establishment versus people. So when the issue is something like the extension of unemployment benefits due to run out December 31st, you look to the networks or to cable it's news. It's bloodless. It's mostly it's bloodless. And it's usually within the framework of this hysteria about deficits when, in fact, polls, and you know we don't love polls, but you look at them, and it's so vivid, the disconnect between what people are seeking, jobs, health care, a better economy, and the elite and the elite media talking endlessly, especially in these last few weeks, about deficits, debt reduction. And that divide, I think, leads people, average people, to turn off and get angry. And that's where, you know, you play such a good yeah. role. We try to get on there and speak our mind. Well, we both try. Um, with respect to deficit reduction yeah. and the fight that really should be seen, you had Jan Schakowsky, also coming from the Deficit Commission, um, with her own progressive right. plan for deficit reduction. There is one. This there, should there be a one. fight. There are going to be a few. I mean, you have on the commission Jan Schakowsky, and she did lay out a good one. You have Bernie Sanders in the Senate. The two of them, I think, will play a good team role. You have a lot of smart uh, progressive groups, EPI, Demos, Campaign for America's Future, uh, coming forward in the next few days, in fact, 
with alternative proposals. Because one thing the elite media does well too is say, oh, they don't have proposals. They're just head in the sand. No, let us change, but let us change in ways that help people. I mean, let's look seriously at cutting the defense budget. Let's look seriously at real progressive taxation. And so I think Jan Schakowsky will play a good yeah. role, too. Now, Warren Buffett was talking about this on uh, the news this weekend. Take a look at Warren Buffett with Christian Amanpour. I think that people at the high end, people like myself, should be paying a lot more in taxes. We have it better than we've ever had it. They say you have to keep those tax cuts, even on the very wealthy, because that is what uh, energizes business and, and capitalism. The rich are always going to say that, you know, that just give us more money and we'll go out and spend more and then it'll all trickle down to the rest of you. But that has not worked the last uh, 10 years and, and uh, I hope the American public is catching on. Katrina. Warren Buffett's played a good role in this area. I mean, he's the one who has said many times prior to this interview that he, you know, he and his ilk pay less in taxes in certain arenas than their chauffeurs or secretaries. Um, I think there is a group of enlightened, wealthy people who are trying to speak to the values that built this country and allowed them to thrive. Uh, there is a group of patriotic millionaires who are speaking out about the need for tax cuts, the need, the need to repeal the tax cuts for the wealthiest because yeah. you need to invest in this country. So, you know, all power to him. Um, and I think, you know, also Bill Gates Sr., this group Responsible Wealth, United for a Fair Economy. So they're working and to they make their voices. And they can actually get on the media, which is at least a good step in the right direction. I know. Quickly, let's talk about your 10 steps or the 10 steps that the Center for American Progress have put out. Right. Things that the president could be doing with those executive authority. Name a few. Yeah, I mean, just a few, the ones that really appeal to me. One is to use executive authority and rule, rulemaking, for example, to really give some strength to the Consumer Protection Financial Bureau, which Elizabeth Warren is the interim head of, as also special assistant. I mean, and the other is some uh, giving real muscle to foreclosure mediation. I mean, this is a, a, a blight, the ongoing foreclosure of millions of people's homes. Uh, the other one is to do an assessment of uh, don't ask, don't tell and mitigate its terrible impact because I don't think we're going to see it repealed in this Congress. I'd like to see the war in Afghanistan ended. Interestingly, that wasn't on the Center for American Progress list. No, though we had a, a bit about how uh, the president could use his executive authority to better balance the political and diplomatic with the military. And I think one very important, which, which Van Jones talks about so eloquently, which is to protect the EPA's regulatory authority to regulate greenhouse emissions, because I think we will see you now have a climate denial caucus in the House. We're going to see swift boating of climate science and scientists. And it's important that progressives pay attention to Lisa Jackson, administrator of the EPA, and the power she has and move behind the president to say, use it. Finally, I also think our White House correspondent, Washington correspondent, Chris Hayes, has uh, had an interesting breakdown blog about what the president could do with procurement power to increase labor's clout, maybe set up and move that White House office that is kind of ghettoized in, pre in Vice President Biden's office into a presidential situation, procurement and the middle class, working class office. Check it out. Check out Chris Hayes' breakdown blog every week at thenation.com. And you can find that list. We'll put a link on our site, too. That's gridtv.org. Katrina Vanden of The Nation, thanks so much. Thank you.